Now today we begin with 1 Samuel. And we're in an area that a great many people find rather, well, using the common colloquialism, they find it boring. But may I say to you, it is like crossing a desert. But there are many oases in this desert. And you're going to find that in these historical books, there are some very precious portions that ought not to be omitted. Now, as we begin today in 1 Samuel, there are some introductory matters I should take up with you. First of all, let me say that First and Second Samuel give us the origin of the kingdom. And the kingdom becomes a very important subject in the Old Testament, and it's an important subject in the New Testament, because the first message of the New Testament was the message of John the Baptist when he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the kingdom that he was talking about may not be the kingdom you are thinking about today, but the kingdom that is in the Old Testament. The kingdom that we find has a very historical basis and also has geographical borders, and it has a king, has real persons in it, and it has a very earthly origin, actually. Now, we are going to see that in this book here. Now, the two books of Samuel were classified as just one book in the Jewish canon. And I very frankly feel like they should be considered as one book. And in the Latin Vulgate, they are the first two of four books of kings. And again, may I say, that would be a proper name for it. Now, the name of Samuel is identified with these first two historical books. Not actually because he's the writer, although we believe that he is the writer of a good portion of it. But his story occurs first, and it is so prominent. He is the one who poured the anointing oil on both Saul and David. And he is considered the author of First Samuel up to the 25th chapter, which records his death. And then Nathan and Gad apparently completed the writing. And if you will look at the American Standard Version in First Chronicles 29, 29, you'll find that that is so stated. But let me turn with you, and this is a very unusual place to begin, but let me turn with you to First Samuel 10, 25. And I read there, Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book, and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Now, this is the book that we're talking about, is First Samuel here. And apparently he did write this. Now, we have in First Samuel things that are very familiar, there are certain familiar features that probably I ought to mention, and the one I've already suggested is the rise of the kingdom. And then you have the story of Hannah. You have the story of little Samuel. You have the story of David and Goliath. And then the friendship of David and Jonathan. And then you have King Saul's visit to the witch of Endor. Now, these are highlights in this first book of Samuel that make it very worthwhile for us to consider this book. You find in 1 Samuel certain subjects that can be considered the theme of the book. And I do not think you could say it's just one thing. For instance, prayer is the theme of the two books of Samuel. 1 Samuel opens with prayer, 2 Samuel closes with prayer, and in between there's a great deal of prayer. Then another theme is that which we've suggested, the kingdom. And you have the change of the government of Israel 
from a theocracy to a kingdom. And you have God's covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7, which is very important, as we shall see. Now you see also the rise of the office of prophet. And the prophet becomes important in this book. And the prophet now is the messenger of God in place of the priest. You see, when Israel was a theocracy, God moved through the priesthood. But when they failed, as we shall see in this book, then God set them aside, raised up the prophets as his messengers, and put a king on the throne. And actually, it was for these people deterioration rather than an improvement. But I want to add just this word. Actually, God's form of government is a kingdom and a king. The problem with different forms of government is not the form of government that is wrong. Actually, any form of government would be good if you had good people. The problem today is not with our form of government. The trouble is with the people that are connected with it and that are trying to make it work, or rather, some seem to be trying to make it not work. But a kingdom is God's ideal, and he intends to put a king on the throne down here. And the king he's going to be put on the throne is going to be a wonderful king. And when he's on the throne, friends, there'll be blessing on this earth. And the earth won't be in the condition that it is in today. I don't buy this sort of thing today that we're building a kingdom and the kingdom is coming and all that sort of thing as if men are going to do it. May I say to you, when Jesus Christ, the prince, is ruling in this world, the prince of peace, the king of kings, and lord of lords, you're not going to have a poverty program. You won't have an ecological program, and you won't have an immoral program. You're going to have righteousness and peace covering this earth like the waters cover the sea. Now you have in these historical books some very interesting persons, and we're going to meet them. I think God would like for us to get acquainted with them. It's good to go with a good crowd. You'll find a good crowd here. And there's a crowd to shun. We have, for instance, quite a contrast between these two books of Samuel and the book of Judges. Now, when we went through the book of Judges, you'll recall that I had a great deal to say about the fact that every man who was a judge had some terrific fault, a defect. One of them was left-handed. Well, now, there's nothing wrong in being a southpaw, But if the man hadn't been a southpaw, he'd never been a judge. And Gideon, we think of Gideon, the brave man. Why, he's the biggest coward that you find in the Bible, friends. And may I say to you that these are little men, but they were an encouragement to many of us who are little people today. We take hope and we take courage and we take refuge in the fact that God will use little people. And he used these men. But now we're going to meet some outstanding folk here in First Samuel. Hannah, Eli, and Samuel, and Saul, and Jonathan, and David. I want to tell you, they're outstanding, every one of them. And we are going to see here that the kingdom shadows forth the coming millennial kingdom in some respects. And there are certain profound global lessons for us in the setting up of the kingdom. And the world needs three things. A king with power who exercises his power righteously. Second, a king who will be in full dependence upon God and who can be trusted with power. The problem today is that there's no human being that can be trusted with power today, and no party for that matter. Then there is a third profound need of the world. The world needs a king who is in full obedience to God. And all that 
is shouted forth here. Now let's come today and get our foot in the door of First Samuel. And we're going to move just a little faster now in this book and in these historical books than we did previously in the book of Acts and in the gospel of John. Now we have here, and I'll not give the outline today other than probably to mention certain great basic outlines here. For instance, in 1 Samuel, you have in the first eight chapters, Samuel, God's prophet. And then you have Saul, Satan's man, chapters 9 through 15. And then you have David, God's man, and Saul, Satan's man, in contrast. And then when you get to Second Samuel, it's all about David. Now we have here in the first two chapters, we have first Hannah's prayer and answer and the birth of Samuel. Now I shall begin reading here, and this is quite a lesson in pronunciation here, but I'll try to get through this first verse. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Kohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephraithite. And he had two wives. Now we start off on the wrong foot. And I know that there'll be people saying, oh, this means God approves of this. No, my friend, if you read this record aright, you'll find out God didn't approve of it. The fact that certain things are recorded in Scripture does not mean God approves of them, or sometimes actually God does not disapprove. He merely is giving you the facts concerning history and persons and events. And so you find that the lie of Satan is recorded in Scripture. But that doesn't mean God approves it. In fact, God very definitely disapproved of it. And you find the sin of man, sin of Adam, sin of Abraham, and the sin of others. God didn't approve of Abraham. You will recall taking that maid Hagar, and God showed his disapproval. fact of the matter is... The sin of Abraham, the fruits of it are still in existence. You see, that boy Ishmael is the father of the Arabians and a very fine Arab guide who took me to the city of Jericho. He told me, he says, Dr. McGee, you forget that we Arabs are also the sons of Abraham. And you know that he was right about that? God didn't approve of that. Look what's happening today and has happened in that land. God does not approve. Now, because Elkanah had two wives doesn't mean God approves it. fact of the matter, they were having trouble in the family, real trouble, which is evident that God wasn't blessing at this particular time at all. Now, he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. The name of the other... Penina, and Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. My friend, that's going to cause a problem in the families, you can see. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And That disturbed me for a long time. Why in the world did Samuel have to tell us that the sons of Eli were there at the tabernacle? And later on we'll find out. And the reason is this. Going up to worship God at the tabernacle wasn't all that you might suppose that it might be. Actually, it was a dangerous place to be because these sons of Eli... They were sons of Belial. Well, they were the sons of the devil, if you please. It wasn't a very nice atmosphere to go into. I believe that sometimes that the worst place you can be is in church, and probably the most dangerous place for you. Uh, I hear people say about the upper room, 
Oh, if I could only been up in the upper room, how wonderful that would have been, would it? Do you know who was in that upper room? He wasn't invited, but he was there. We're told that the devil, Satan, had entered into this man Judas. Satan was there in the upper room. That was the most dangerous place in Jerusalem at that time to be. And so going up to worship God had its problems, had its difficulties in that day. And there was evil present there. And it's interesting that this is mentioned at this particular juncture. Now we are told, and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, which means he gave to her more than he actually gave to the other one and all of her children. Why? For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sower. Who was her adversary? The other wife. You see, they weren't on speaking terms. That wasn't a very pleasant home. Who told you that God approved of this sort of thing? I think God disapproved of it. They're having trouble. They're having family trouble. And there wasn't any counselor to go to at that time. Now notice, her adversary also provoked her sower for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And probably Hannah was one of the most miserable persons in the world at this time. But you know that she goes now to God in prayer. And as, verse 7, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept so. Now you know what she prayed for. She prayed for a son. Will you listen to her? She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I'll give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. In other words, she would make him a Nazarite unto God, separated unto the service of God. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, Eli was the high priest, and he saw this woman come up and pray, and he watched her mouth as it moved, and apparently he couldn't read her lips. And when she cried out like this, notice the reaction of Eli. Now, Hannah She spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And what a sidelight that is upon the conditions of that day. Going to find out these sons of Eli, they drank and caroused that. And old Eli, their father, knew it and shut his eyes to it, you know. He was an indulgent father. And... When this woman, Hannah, came and prayed like this with the zeal of her heart, old Eli thought she is drunk. You know why? Because there had been others there that were drunken. This wasn't really the best place to come and to be in that day, my friend. Now will you notice? And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thine wine from thee. And Hannah answered, And said, Now listen to her. No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. You don't see much praying like Hannah's today, do you? That people might mistake you being drunk the way you pray. 
our prayers are very dignified. Now, will you notice, "...count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto." Then Eli answered. Now, Eli sees his mistake. And he said, "...go in peace. God of Israel, grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him." And she said, "...let thine handmaid find grace." In thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they arose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And that's what Samuel means, ask of the Lord. Now, this book of First Samuel, you see, opens with the cry of a godly woman. While the people are crying for a king, Hannah is crying out for a child, and God builds the throne on a woman's cry. You see, when a woman takes her exalted place, God builds her a throne. And what a contrast, friends, that is to this day. Right now and for the past few months, we've heard nothing in the world on news but abortion, abortion, and abortion. Now, I'm not going into that problem. I don't feel like that's really my prerogative. But what a contrast this is. Women today not wanting children, wanting to sin but not pay the consequences for their sin. And my position in this is simply this, that when a person sins, they are to bear the fruit of their sin. And if a child is to be born, that child should be born. And that should be the responsibility of the one who sinned and brought him into the world. My people today are trying to get away from the fruit of their sin. But you can understand one thing. God says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We're living in the day of abortion. Hannah lived in a day when she wanted a son, and she dedicated that son unto the Lord. And on her cry, God built a kingdom. What a tremendous tribute, and what a wonderful monument this is to this woman's cry. Now we find that she went up to the Lord and took her offering, and she remembered her vow that she had made. And in verse 24, when she weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks, one ephah of flour, bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worship the Lord there. May I say to you, she kept her vow to God. She said, I have promised to bring this little one to the Lord, and here he is. Now, I come today into this second chapter. You find that this chapter opens with the prayer of Hannah. And this is one of the great prayers of the Scripture. Let me begin reading now, verse 1, chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. The horn speaks of strength, something to hold on to. And she says her strength, it's in the Lord. And my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. Now, it's quite obvious what 
this woman, Hannah, is rejoicing over. God has given her a child. There's been a present deliverance. Now, as we've indicated before many times on this program, salvation comes in three tenses. It's such a wonderful thing. We can say, I have been saved. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath right now everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment or condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now, that means that God has delivered us by the death of Christ from the guilt of sin. That's justification. Now, God has delivered us from what the old theologians call the pollution of sin, And that's a present deliverance. That is a deliverance from the weaknesses of the flesh, the sins of the flesh, and the thoughts of the mind, and the actions of the will. That is a present deliverance, and that, of course, is what Hannah is talking about. We call that today sanctification. And then there is the deliverance of death, that which is in the future. And he has delivered us from that. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, what we know when he shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so that is a future deliverance. I have been saved. I am being saved. I shall be saved. And she says, I rejoice in thy salvation. You remember Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. And the psalmist again and again says, salvation is is of the Lord. And that's the great truth of salvation by the grace of God today. It means that we've been justified freely by his grace. And that word freely means without a cause. No cause in us. He found the explanation in himself. And so this is a very wonderful prayer. Let me move through it rather hurriedly. Verse 2, there is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Now, the Lord is spoken of as a rock in the Old Testament. Now, the Lord Jesus is called the chief cornerstone. And he spoke of that on this rock, I will build my church. And the same rock that Hannah rested on is the rock we rest on today. There's no rock like our God, by the way. Now, verse 3. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. And when we come to God in prayer, we need to be very careful, friends, that we do not let our pride cause us to stumble, that we recognize our weakness, recognize our insufficiency, our inability, and the fact that we have really no claim on God. Sometimes we hear people say, why didn't God hear my prayer? Well, to put it very frankly, why should he? (laughs) What claim do you have on him? Well, my friends, we have a wonderful claim, and that's when we come in the name of Christ. We have his right and his claim. But you must remember, it must be according to his will. Now notice verse 4. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. They that are full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxen feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, for he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. And the whole thought here is that God gives life, the Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away, and he has the right to do it. Now, until you and I have the power to give life, we have no right to take life away. Only God has that. And believe me, God will take the blame, if that's what you want to call it, for the death of Ananias and Sapphira. And he doesn't apologize. And he doesn't apologize for the fact that he intends to judge the wicked. They'll go down into death. Separation from God. God doesn't apologize from that. Why? This is his universe. We're his creatures. He's running it his way. Now, if you don't like it, as I said to a young student at Berkeley not too long ago, a fellow that has come to Christ, there are many things that he wasn't willing to accept. 
And I said, if you don't like the way God has worked out this plan of salvation and the things he's doing, you can go off over yonder somewhere, make your own universe, set up your own rules, run it your way. But as long as you're in God's universe, you're going to have to do it his way. And the most wonderful thing is that you and I can bow to him and come in under the blessing of God if we're willing to do it. Now, Notice verse 6, "...the Lord killeth, maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave, bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor, and he maketh rich, he bringeth low, and lifteth up." And by the way, that's a problem that many of us are going to have. I can't understand why God has permitted certain to be rich and others to be poor today. I think I could distribute wealth a little bit better than he's done it. I'll be very frank with you. But you know, he didn't leave that to me. He says that he's still in that business. And by the way, he'll be able to explain that someday. And I'm going to wait for the explanation. I know he has the answer. Verse 8, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. He lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. And what did he put the pillars on? He just didn't tell us. And we know today it hangs on nothing. Now, will you notice, we find in verse 9, "...he'll keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail." By your effort, by your power, your strength, you can never accomplish anything for God. And Christians today need to recognize that. Friends, it's only what you and I do by the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to count. And we ought to learn to be dependent upon Him and rest upon Him. Now notice verse 10. Here is one of the great verses of the Scripture. This is the first mention of the Messiah, that is, of the word Messiah. Let me read the verse now. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, that word anointed is the Hebrew word Messiah. And it's translated in the New Testament by the word Christos, and it comes to us in English as Christ. It's the title of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have the first mention of the Messiah. God is getting ready to set up the kingdom now as they've rejected the theocracy, and God is going to send a king. Now, this is the wonderful prayer of this woman. Verse 11, And Elkanah, went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister under the Lord before Eli the priest. Now, Hannah had brought the little fellow after he was weaned and brought him yonder to the tabernacle. I'm sure a great many people say, well, you know, he's in a wonderful place. He's in a place of protection and shelter. Let's be very careful about that. May I say to you, was he in that kind of a place? Absolutely not. Notice the next verse. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. That is, they're sons of the devil, friends. They knew not the Lord. They were not saved. And here they were, sons of the high priest, hanging around the tabernacle and ministering there. Did you know that a great many folk today, and I want to be very careful in saying this, They say, oh, I want to send my son to a Christian school. A man said to me some time ago, well, I sent my son to this school. I felt very comfortable about it. I was perfectly satisfied. I felt he was in a good place. Well, thank God for the Christian school. But you see, he quit praying for him. That boy was probably in the most dangerous place he could be in because there's grave danger there. There are those that say, well, you know, I go to a certain church, and this is such a wonderful place. My friend, that's where the devil goes, to those wonderful places. Remember, we said he was in the upper room. He was there, and that was the most dangerous place in Jerusalem that evening, was in the upper room, because that's where the devil was. And so we need to remember 
that the boy that goes away or the person that goes to a certain church, they still need prayer. They may be in a dangerous place. Now, this little boy Samuel is in a dangerous place, and his mama's going to continue to pray for him. You may be sure of that. Now, will you notice what happens here? And I'm not going to read this. It is rather tedious because... Actually, what the sons of Eli were doing, the people would bring their sacrifices. And these sons of Eli would take the sacrifice, and instead of offering it to God as they should have, they were keeping it. And they were keeping back the best for themselves and were not offering this to the Lord. In other words, they were running a religious racket, by the way. And this is one of the first religious rackets. This is what they were doing. They were totally dishonest in the Lord's work. Now, will you notice, we find that not only did they do that, verse 17, wherefore the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for man abhorred the offering of the Lord. And that caused a great many people to turn from God. They saw what was happening there at the tabernacle. And you know, today, friends, we need to be very careful about our lives and about what's happening in our churches today. We need to be very careful. This idea today of shutting our eyes to sin in the church and covering up, don't you know that that's one of the protests that many of these young people are making today? I've had the privilege recently of seeing... Actually, over a hundred of them turned to Christ, and I've talked with them, and I've seen them in action. And many of these young people disturb me. They are against the organized church, and they speak of the hypocrisy that's in it. That's what happened in that day. It happens today. Or as these young folks say to me, one young man said, Dr. McGee, this turns me off as far as the church is concerned. I haven't any answer, I'm sorry, to that type of thing. Now, will you notice not only that, but notice this little fellow, Samuel, is growing under this influence. Notice what is happening here now. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And you know, this is one of the tenderest, loveliest things that is said. Hannah loved this little boy, Samuel. It's her boy, you know. But she promised the Lord. She says, I'm going to give him to the Lord. And she keeps the word. But all during the year, she's making this little coat for him, and she gives it to him. May I say to you, there's nothing quite as tender and as loving as this type of thing. I think one of the greatest joys that Ms. McGee and I have had is in going about and picking out clothes, a little suit or a little something or other for our grandson. There's just nothing that is as satisfying as that. My heart goes out to Hannah as we see her here. Now, will you notice that Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And you know God was good to Hannah. She conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. She had five other children. For she had that little boy that she never forgot during the year. She made him every year a little coat. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now, in spite of this bad environment, Samuel grew before the Lord. Now, let me read this. Now, Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. Here's an indulgent father who shut his eyes to the sins of his sons. And notice their awful, gross immorality and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I hear a great deal today about what they call new morality. Well, I think the two sons of Eli, I think they beat the crowd today to what they call a new morality. But it wasn't even new in their day. It goes back to the time of the flood. Now, verse 23, And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? What a gentle rebuke. 
he slapped them on the wrist. For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. My, this was a scandal, an open scandal in Israel. Listen to him. Nay, my sons, for it's no good report that I hear ye make the Lord's people to transgress. As priests, so people. That was what was happening. And his rebuke is too gentle, by the way. Actually, he's just an indulgent father. Now, if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And the child Samuel grew on. He was in favor both with the Lord and also with man. Now, in this bad environment, Samuel, dedicated to God, backed up by a mother's interest in prayer, he's growing in favor with God, and God's going to use him. Now, God sent a prophet to old Eli and told him that he was through with him as the high priest, and the high priest, his line would end. And no longer would God move through the priest, but God now is raising up a priest prophet, actually, and that was this boy Samuel, and he will minister for the Lord, but his office will be that of a prophet. Now, we read in verse 30, and I drop down to that, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Let's be very careful in our lives that we honor God. The Lord is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And the redeemed need to say so today. Behold, the day is come. God says that I will cut off thine arm, the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And that's going to happen, as we shall see. And this shall be a sign unto thee, verse 34, and shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Now God says, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever." Now, who is that? Well, actually, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you notice that back in Hannah's prayer, he's mentioned as the King, the Messiah that is to come. He's mentioned here now as a priest, and he's also been mentioned by Moses as a prophet. The Lord Jesus is prophet, priest, and king, and he's the only one that ever fulfilled all these offices. Now we come in chapter 3 to the call of Samuel as a prophet priest. Now this chapter is ordinarily reserved for children, and I'd like to take it out of the nursery today and give it to the senior citizens. That's where it belongs. Not only for a beginner's department, but also for those that are sitting in the sanctuary. And actually, Alice in Wonderland was written by Lewis Carroll. He wrote it for his grandchildren, but you know it's philosophy. And it really was indictment of his day in the social order. And it is a deep philosophy. And so here, this story marks one of the greatest, I think, transitional periods the form of government is changed in this chapter. God adopts a new program. We move from a theocracy to a monarchy, from the priest to the king. And Eli is the last here of the priests, that is, of the line, and Samuel is the first of the prophets, as we shall see in this chapter. And we are told in verse 20, "...all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord." This is very important to see. And it's this man Samuel now that poured the anointing oil on both Saul and David. Now, God called him four times. 
And I think this rather nullifies the popular epigram today that opportunity knocks only one time at the door. And then I think it also answers the argument that man can turn at his leisure to God. I believe that there is an appointed time. And that now is the accepted time. Today, if you'll hear his voice. And there comes a day when you won't hear his voice, by the way. Now, friends, we seem to be getting off of the ground here in 1 Samuel rather slowly, but it's a very important area that we're in, and especially that that we come to today. It is the call of Samuel and can be called the last call God made to him. And we read in verse 1, "...and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious." In those days, there was no open vision. Well, the first thing for us to note here is that the word child doesn't mean he was just a little fella. Josephus gives the age of twelve. Probably he was a teenager. Solomon said, In his prayer, I'm but a little child. Well, he was a grown man that had just been made king. And Jeremiah was called to the priest's office, and he says, I can't speak for I'm a child. Well, he was thinking of, I think, his spiritual maturity there rather than physical. And the child Samuel here means he was a young man, and he ministered unto the Lord before Eli. You don't have a four-year-old child running around serving the Lord in the tabernacle, by the way. The word of the Lord was precious. Now, that means that it was scarce. It was a scarce article, by the way. And that's the reason that you read here that the word of the Lord was scarce in that day, or precious in those days. That is, God was not revealing himself at this particular time. He does begin to move in now, and he's calling this boy Samuel as a prophet. You see, he's moving from the position of the judge and the priest to that now of the prophet. And the prophet becomes the spokesman for the king. God never really spoke directly to the king. It was through the prophet. And we'll see that as we move along. Now, it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. Remember, the high priest was to take care of the lamp. And he put oil in it, and now it is burnt down and about to go out. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not. Lie down again. He went and lay down. He just thought the young man was just dreaming, you know, and had a dream. He said, Go lie down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son. Lie down again. Now, we need to note something here, for these first two calls are a call to salvation. Their last two calls, God called him four times, by the way, and the last two are for service. The first two for salvation. Notice verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. So at this time... Samuel is being called to salvation. He didn't know the Lord, and God is calling him to salvation. Now, what is the age of accountability? I think he'd reach that, and that God now is going to hold him responsible. Well, in Israel, we've already seen in the book of Numbers, it was 20 when God called them to war, when a man was able to go to war. And then the Levites didn't begin service till they were 25, and the priests at age 30. Well, how old was Samuel? Well, I do not know how old he was. I could make a suggestion to you, and I may or may not be right, by the way. Over in Numbers, the 14th chapter, verse 29, let me read this. 
He says, "...your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from twenty years old and upward which have murmured against me." Now, when they were under twenty years, God didn't hold them responsible. Is twenty the age of accountability? I don't know. I'm merely suggesting it's much older than a great many people seem to think today. And I think this boy Samuel was in his teens. Now, God calls him to salvation. The question has always been, would God have called him a fifth time, a sixth time, a seventh time, or a fiftieth time? Well, I don't know. I do believe this, that with all my heart, that there is a time to be saved. It's been expressed like this. There is a time, I know not when, a place I know not where, which marks the destiny of men to heaven, our despair. How long may man go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope end? And where begins the confines of despair? One answer from those skies is sin. Ye who from God depart, while it is called today repent, and harden not your heart. It's quite interesting, friends, that there will come a day when apparently men don't seem to be able to turn to God. The chaplain that was at the prison where Herman Goering was placed at the time of his trial and then when he was to be executed, he went in and had a long interview with Goering, and he put before him, as he wrote it later, the necessity of preparing himself to meet God. And he says in the course of our conversation, he ridicules certain Bible truths and refused to accept that Christ died for sinners. It was a conscious denial of the power of the blood. Death is death was the substance of his last words. As I recall to him the hope of his little daughter to meet him in heaven, he replied, she believes in her manner and I in mine. And then this man left very much discouraged and he says, in less than an hour, he heard that Herman Goering had committed suicide. May I say to you that God called to this man twice, and I think he'll call maybe many times to you, but there apparently comes a day when a man is hard. And so this is a tremendous lesson. Then we have the first two calls to salvation, and then the last two calls that we have here are to service. Will you notice verse 8? I'm reading now. First Samuel 3, 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child, a young man. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And this is the third call, now the fourth. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant hear it. And you remember that this is the way the Lord called Saul of Tarsus. He called him to salvation. Who art thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. Rise, stand on thy feet. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And God had called them to salvation and service at the same time. But God had called it. Proverbs says in Proverbs 29, 1, He that being often reproven hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Now, I do not believe you can commit an unpardonable sin that you do something today, you couldn't come to God and be forgiven tomorrow. But does God withdraw his grace? Well, no, never will he do that. But men can resist and rebel and reject, and their conscience becomes seared with a hot iron. And like Cain or Balaam or Samson or Korah or Ahab, all of these can reach a day when they can turn their back against God. Felix said, I'll hear you at some convenient time. And King Agrippa replied, And almost thou makest me a Christian. 
And Paul says, King Agrippa, not almost, but altogether. Christ saved one thief that man need not despair, but he only saved one, but that man need not presume. And now God speaks to this man, and the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'll do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I'll also make an end. God says when he says something, it's the same as done. And we have in the Old Testament what has been called a prophetic tense. It's a past tense, but it speaks of the future. God speaks of things that have not yet happened as if they've already happened. And when he says they're going to happen, they're going to happen. Now, as we saw last time when we entered chapter 3, we were told that all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Now, this boy, Samuel, is loyal to Eli to the very end. He didn't attempt to undermine him. He went to him and told him everything that God had said to him. And I want to say this, that in God's service today, if you're under some other man, you be loyal to him. Don't tell me you can be loyal to Christ and be disloyal to God's man that is above you. Oh, how that's needed today. And I wish that were taught more in our seminaries instead of teaching some of the things that, very frankly, just don't seem to be getting us anywhere. Now, verse 21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh, by the word of the Lord. How did God reveal himself? By his word. And God today is not revealing himself, but God today is illuminating by his Spirit the page of Scripture that you and I can come to know him, to know the Lord Jesus, and to know God, and this is life eternal. Now we come to the fourth chapter of First Samuel. And as we come here to the fourth chapter, we see this moving to the time when God brings to a conclusion the thing that he has said that he would do. And we see here the low spiritual condition of Israel at this particular time. And we're also going to see that God makes good what he said about the line of Eli. Eli's son are slain, and Eli drops dead. Now will you notice chapter 4. This is a very dark picture, by the way, that we have in chapter 4. And I'm beginning reading now, 1 Samuel 4, 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitch beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched an Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Now listen to this, and this is a revelation of their superstition, how far they were from God, and of their self-sufficiency, and of their selfishness. Listen to this. I'm reading now, verse 3, First Samuel 4. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now, believe me, they're superstitious. Israel now, without consulting Samuel, they went out to battle against the Philistines. What happened? It led to defeat. God was to lead these people. And Samuel now is God's prophet, and he's the spokesman now. What happened then? They think now that what was lacking, and they should have taken the ark with them. Well, they had the tradition that the ark had gone down into the water and the Jordan had opened up, and so they brought the ark of the covenant into battle 
thinking that its presence would bring victory. My friend, this reveals the superstitious paganism of the people who thought that there was some merit in the object. The merit was not in that box, because God wasn't in a box, and you can't get him in a box. The merit was in the presence and the person of God. Oh, today in church work, there are a great many people think that God today is in a box, and they're just as superstitious. And even in our good churches, they said, now look, this is a method. And that's a nice little package deal, by the way. You can put it away in a box. Now you take it out. And this method is going to work. This method will solve our problems. And so many people go in that direction today. My friend, that's not being spiritual. It's being superstitious. The merit is in Christ. The merit today is in him, and it's whether he's with us or not. That's the important thing. Let me turn that around. The merit is whether we are with him today. That's the thing that is all important. Now, they go to battle, and so what's going to happen? So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the chariot beams. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And these are paid preachers. They're just going to do what they're told to do. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Boy, they had a great rally there. Oh, they thought they were getting somewhere spiritually. But this is nothing in the world but idolatry. They're now worshiping a box, not worshiping God at all. Let's be very careful today in our ceremonies and in our ritual and in our church. Are we worshiping a church? Are we worshiping a man? Are we worshiping a method? Are we worshiping a particular place? Are we really worshiping the living and the true God today? Now, the Philistines heard it, and we are told in verse 6, And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp, and the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. You see, that to them was an idol. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. They haven't done this before. And they're not only superstitious, they're ignorant, by the way. They don't know there's no merit in that box at all. Now, they cry out, Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues of the wilderness. And they certainly are ignorant of the living and true God. Now, they have to have a rally. And they have a rally, and they then come against Israel. And what happened? Well, they lost the battle. Israel did. And then a man of Benjamin, out of the army, verse 12, he came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. When he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. Now old Eli, with all of his fault, he's a sorry father, but he at least was God's high priest. And he had a concern for the things of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. It was defeat, you see. When Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now notice this. Eli was ninety and eight years old. His eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army. I fled today out of the army. And he said, What's there done, my son? Now listen to this message. And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. It came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, his neck break. He died, for he was an old man and heavy. And he judged Israel 40 years. Now, Eli actually was 
I think the last of the judges, though I think we can say Samuel, can be considered the last. But here is one of the last of the judges, and he's a priest. And he's the great high priest at this time. And I think you need to note, when they told him about the death of his sons, certainly he was an indulgent father that broke his heart. But there's also something else to be said here that's, I think, very important to note. He maintained his composure when he was told about the death of his son. But when he told him the ark was taken, that's when he fell over backwards and died. And I think he had a heart attack, to tell the truth. He's a great big fella, fat, fell over backwards, and he was in an elevated place, broke his neck. My friend, may I say to you, I want to say this on behalf of Eli. I think he was actually God's man. Now, you see, this brings Samuel now into the position where he's going to be God's man and he's going to be God's spokesman in a very definite way. Now, that brings us to chapter 5 here. And actually what we see is the captured ark was placed in the house of Dagon, idol of the Philistines, and the idol fell over and broke. And in fear, they sent the ark to Gath, and then it was transferred to Ekron. They thought they had something good on their hands. And then when every time they'd bring it into a place, the idol of Dagon would fall over. Now, I want to submit this to you. I don't think you'll find this in any commentary. And I certainly could be wrong, no question about that. But I'd like for you to note this that when the ark of the Lord was brought in, the idol of Dagon, well, it fell over and broke. Nothing was left there, but the stump of Dagon was left. And I believe that this reveals that God has a real sense of humor. (laughs) The idol of Dagon would fall over and would break. Then they'd move it to another place, and the idol there would fall over. And I think that this reveals the Lord has a real sense of humor doing this sort of thing. It really annoyed the Philistines. didn't accomplish too much, but they see that there's no merit in them having that ark. That's for sure. And they ask the question in verse 8 of chapter 5, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And I do not mean to be irreverent. They're passing the book. <laughs> They wanted that ark. When they got it, they didn't want it, you see. And now they pass it up to Gath, and when Gath got it, and they had the same experience with it, well, they passed it on up to Ekron, and they just keep passing it around. And so what is going to happen now, they're going to have to get it back into Israel. And so in chapter 6, the Philistines returned the ark to Israel, and they put it on a cart. Now, nothing's going to happen to them for putting it on a cart. And you know why? Well, very candidly, they didn't know any better. God's not going to hold them responsible. But Israel knew better. And we're going to find out later on a man put his hand on the ark, and he's smitten dead. And what did that mean? God is saying, you know better. I do think God holds you. You'll be judged by the light that you have. That doesn't mean you'll be saved, but it does mean this, that every people have enough light that they're not living up to the light they have. And therefore, to be judged even by the light you have doesn't mean you're saved at all. It means that you're lost. You see, God said in Romans, the second chapter, that the Gentiles that have not the law, they'll be judged without the law, with the light that they have. But that doesn't mean they're saved. It means they're lost, because no man lives up to the light that he has.